You're watching NewsX and this is a global exclusive. We have been covering the Kanishka bombing case for over a week now. And today, what we have with us viewers is truly explosive for the first time on television and anywhere in the world. We have accessed the 220 page long Justice B.N. Kirpal report. This was a report that was commissioned by the Indian government and its findings were submitted just a year after the bombing in the March of 1986, 220 pages of conclusive findings of the Indian government we have with us. Let's put this out that you, you see it there on your screens. We have the report. I have with me Risha Gulati and Mega Sharma with us in the studios. Risha, over to you. We have to take our viewers through all the details. Okay, let's not, let's not do this one by one. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as Devika has already mentioned, uh, the report concluded, uh, a committee was set up under, his, under Mr. Justice B.N. Kirpal, who was then the uh, la later Chief Justice of India. Uh, by March of 1986, in very quick time, the report came out with the culminations of the Indian part of the Court of Inquiry and Investigation into the air crash. The report, uh, which was put on the table in the March of 1986, has never come out in the national press ever before. This is the first time in 40 years that the full report with the full details of exactly what we knew happened. Remember, the Canadians put four people on prosecution. They botched up the prosecution. Some would say conducted a massive cover-up operation, both in the preceding and the aftermath of a terror attack that was the biggest terror attack until 9-11. 269 Canadians died, 24 Indians died in this. I'm going to start off uh, and do a full analysis of the report. It's 228 pages long. The first 30 pages, ladies and gentlemen, is the purpose of the inquiry, the introduction, the preamble, what was taking place to set up the report. There are formalities, okay? The crux starts from page number 31. And let me, I'm going to ask my camera person to get zoomed in so that we can actually read the text very carefully, okay? Uh, I'm also going to request, uh, uh, so here we have it, okay? So, point number 202.1.2. The flight from Toronto to Montreal was made up of the following. Passengers originating at Toronto and their baggage. Transit passengers and their baggage continuing their flight to Montreal. Two diplomatic bags from the Indian Consulate General, Vancouver, via Air Canada cargo flight and some Air India mail. The fifth pod engine and its associate parts, they were carrying uh, a spare engine on board the aircraft as well to be brought to India. And interline passengers and their baggage from connecting flights as detailed before. This is the crucial thing because it was the transit passengers baggage in which the bomb was planted. Two passengers boarded from Saskatoon from Air, India, Air Canada flight AC-102. Four passengers came from Edmonton from Air Canada Flight AC-106. One passenger came from Winnipeg on Air Canada Flight 170. Four other passengers from Winnipeg on the same flight. And this is the flight from which the bomb was transferred over. Ten passengers from Air Canada Flight AC-136 from Vancouver. Okay, just hold on to this, hold on to your thoughts and I'm going to get into some details on this so that we can have a, a, a more detailed and relaxed conversation. We need a, we need a, yeah, we need a steady, steady camera so that we can focus on this, okay? One passenger, can we get rid of this uh, 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 watermark for a few seconds so that we can read the report, please? One passenger by the name of M. Singh checked in at Vancouver on the Canadian Pacific flight CP060, Vancouver, Toronto on the 22nd of June, 1985, got one piece of his luggage interlined, which means transferred to Air India flight AI-181, even though he had no confirmed reservation on flight AI-181. This passenger, however, did not board the flight at Vancouver itself and also did not check in for Air India flight 181-182 at Toronto. It was this passenger, M. Singh, who put a bag on board 
the flight in Vancouver did not board that flight. Okay, did not board that flight, and subsequently never boarded AI Flight 182 that blew up 190 kilometers off the coast of Ireland, killing all souls on board in the most horrific of fashions. Now, here is another interesting piece of detail, which is going on on what was happening at the airport. At 19.30 hours, announcement was made for the primary security check of the passengers in their hand baggage. The passengers passed through the door frame metal detector and their hand baggage was checked in through the x-ray machine. The passengers were also subjected to physical security check with the help of handheld metal detectors. The transit passengers to Montreal and their hand baggage were also subjected to these security checks while their checked in baggage after clearance by the Canadian customs authorities was placed by the passengers themselves on the conveyor belt while they were still in a sterile area. In this way, there was personal identification by the passengers of all checked in baggage except the baggage which had been interlined to this flight. Which means that the people who boarded the flight at the last pit stop before heading over the Atlantic, there was a physical checking of the baggages and each baggage piece had been personally identified. What could not and was not identified was the baggage that was coming in from the transit side of all the passengers I've mentioned on the transit slide. The flight was closed for check-in at 21.50 hours. There were 10 no-shows. 10 people holding tickets did not show up to board the flight. The security check passengers remaining in the holding area till boarding was announced. At the boarding gate, secondary security checks. The passengers were frisked and their hand baggage was physically checked, which means that there is a certain sense of confidence that it is very unlikely that the point of in interjection of the bomb happened in the hand baggage and the rater forensic evidence will prove that it was indeed the forward cargo hold where the bomb was planted and it was planted in a transit bag most likely with this passenger who never boarded any of the flights. Uh, the more details go on over here. Now, here is the interesting part in 2.1.7. 68 transit passengers had disembarked at Toronto for completing customs and immigration checks. However, only 65 of these passengers reboarded the aircraft as per the transit cards collected at the boarding gate. It is evidence that almost every flight of Air India to Canada, two or three transit passengers, some reason did not reboard the flight at Toronto. Some Toronto passengers traveling to India buy their tickets Montreal, India, Montreal instead of Toronto, India, Toronto for which the fare is higher. And then they travel by bus to Montreal to catch the Air India flight to India. On their return journey when they get down in Toronto for custom check immigration they simply do not reboard the flight even though the reservations are up to Montreal. So there was a precedence for this. These passengers sometimes inform Air India personnel at Toronto about their not reboarding However, no such passenger of informed Air India personnel on the 22nd of June. There was a crew change at Toronto. The flight and cabin crew members who took over for flight 181, 182 had been laid over in Toronto for the, for the week prior to the accident flight. And they were scheduled to take the flight up to London where they were to be relieved by another set of crew. They, of course, would never make it to London. Captain H.S. Narendra was the commander of the flight. Captain S.S. Binder was the co-pilot and Mr. D.D. Dumasia was the flight engineer. In addition, there were 19 cabin crew members. All the crew members reported together at the airport at 21.30. As per the practice existing at that time, the flight crew and cabin crew were not subjected to frisking checks and their hand baggage were also not security checked. Their checked-in baggage was, however, security checked along with the other checked-in baggage of passengers. The interline baggage, the translate baggage, was brought to the international baggage makeup area by the Air Canada staff. But as mentioned earlier, it was not personally identified and matched with passengers. This was the key point that allowed Rayat and the mastermind Parmar to get the baggage on board. Blasphemous in a modern day and age, but that's how they did it. 
The checked in baggage of the originating passengers and crew, members of AI-8182, was sent on a conveyor belt to the baggage makeup area. All the checked in baggage along with the interline baggage was required to be security checked on the X-ray machine, which was located in the baggage makeup area at the end of the belt number 4. It has been reported that the X-ray machine was working intermittently only for some period at about 8.45 p.m. Now, none of the reports have ever concluded collusion. We are just now seeing incompetence. But for some reason, all the transit baggage was not checked. For some maybe technical reason, the X-ray machine was not working exactly at that time, at, at 8.45 when the baggage rechecking was supposed to take place. It woke down and there was a, no picture on the screen. The machine could not be repaired on that day as it was a weekend and no technician could be contacted. Believe it or not. Then, in addition to the above, few envelopes containing some flight documents addressed to the accounts office Air India Bombay and one envelope addressed to commercial headquarters Air India Bombay from Air India town office in Toronto were collected by Messrs Mega International. The aircraft was refueled by, us, by, by the CAF FAS with 14,000 litres of fuel. On 8th June, number one engine of the Air India Boeing 747 aircraft VTEGC had failed. The failed engine was to be ferried to Bombay on this flight on the 22nd of June. The failed engine and their associated parts were brought in. Now, the pre-loaded four pallets and one container were brought to the aircraft by MS Mega International personnel from their warehouse. This was the engine. This included the cowling, the fittings, the components and all were then loaded onto the aircraft. On account of the delay in loading the cowls, departure of the flight was delayed by 1 hour and 25 minutes. So the flight took off 1 hour 25 minutes late. Senior Flight Dispatcher Air India Toronto did the flight dispatch of AI-181-182 for sectors Toronto, Montreal, London. He briefed the flight crew members about the flight plan, weather, air traffic control and fuel requirements. The flight plans for the sector Toronto, Montreal, London were duly accepted and signed off by the commander of the flight whose name we have already mentioned here. Now, the aircraft took off just past midnight on the 23rd of June 1985. The maintenance manager and passenger service supervisor of Air India travelled on board the aircraft for their duties at Montreal. In all, there were 270 passengers on board in addition to the 22 crew. The route from Toronto to Montreal, the flight was uneventful and the aircraft landed in Montreal. No issues were reported on the flight between Toronto and Montreal. No snag was reported by the flight crew. The aircraft was parked in Cluster, Bay, Cluster 1 Bay 114. 65 passengers destined to Montreal along with their three Air India personnel mentioned deplaned at Montreal. The remaining 202 passengers who had joined the flight at Toronto remained on board the aircraft as transit passengers were not allowed to disembark at Montreal. Baggage handlers offloaded three containers of baggage, one valuable container and four cargo containers from the aircraft. This was the stuff that was removed from the aircraft. Transit check C of the aircraft was carried out in Montreal. The flight engineer also carried out a pre-flight inspection, found that the rear latch handle of the fifth pod engine fan cowling was loose. He informed the same to an Air India technician who flared the handle and applied high-speed tape. There was no other snag observed during the inspection. Another 104,000 kilograms uh, of fuel uh, was, the, was the starting load for the aircraft, which was adequate for 8 hours, 40 minutes of flying time. The commander accepted and signed the certificate of acceptance of the aircraft. All the checks were completed. Now, there was no other cargo for this flight accepted for a small package weighing less than 1 kilogram containing medicines for a cancer treatment of a patient in New Delhi. This parcel was received at 3.30 on the 21st of June and loaded onto the container. Five baggage containers, one valuables container and two empty containers were loaded thereby into the aircraft. The checked in passengers in the hand baggage went to the departure sterile area. At the entrance of the departure sterile area, staff used X-ray units and metal detectors to check the passengers and their hand baggage. At approximately 1 a.m. on the 23rd of June, after the primary security check was completed, the passengers proceeded to the boarding gate number 80. At this location, the secondary security check was done. Hand baggage were also subjected to further physical and visual check by the crew. 
A total of 105 passengers boarded the flight AI-182 at, at Mirabel Airport. This is in Montreal. It was determined that all the passengers who had checked in board the aircraft, there was no interline passenger. At Montreal, there were five no-shows and two go-shows. In all, 307 passengers were on board the aircraft. The flight plan and the load and the trim sheet indicated 303 passengers, as four of them were of the six infants were not included in the passenger list. Then you had the seating distribution. Zone A, first class, had only one seat occupied. Zone B, club class, had nil seats occupied. Upper, desk, upper deck club class, seven seats occupied. Zone C, economy, 106 seats occupied. Zone D, economy, 85 seats occupied. Zone E, economy, 108 seats occupied. Total number of seats, 377. Total occupied, 301 plus six infants. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the flight as it took off. The three suspected suitcases were not loaded on the aircraft and were detained in the baggage makeup room. After the names of the passengers to whom the suitcases had belonged had been identified, the same were transferred to the decompression chamber of airline where they were examined with the aid of a police explosive dog with negative results. The suitcases were kept overnight in the said chamber and they were opened. It was found they contained no explosive items. So they did deplane three suitcases of the passengers who did not board. However, as was found out in later parts of the investigation, it is suspected that that one suitcase that transitioned without Mr. M Singh ever boarding at Vancouver was suspected to be the, fly, the suitcase that, con that contained the high explosive. The aircraft took off from Montreal at 2.18 a.m. Its estimated time of arrival in London was 08.33. The CVR and the ATC tapes show that the flight was normal and quite uneventful. Suddenly, at about 07.14, when the flight was being monitored by air traffic control at Shannon, with the help of secondary surveillance radar, the aircraft disappeared from the radar scope. At 0.17.0714, a quarter past seven, the aircraft disappeared from the radar scope after having a flight that had lasted for the better part of five and a half hours uneventful. Subsequently, the ATC at Shannon got to know that the aircraft had met with an accident and its wreckage was sighted about 110 miles west-southwest of Cork and Ireland. The 307 people, including 22 crew, crew, are now dead. Their bodies are strewn over the Atlantic Ocean. Devika, back to you. That's, I mean, these are just absolutely shocking details, viewers. And as we've mentioned, this is for the first time ever that anybody has managed to access all the 220 pages of India's investigation, an investigation that took Canada a better part of three decades to put out. We did in just a few months after the air crash that took the lives of over 300 passengers, not just, of course, this aircraft, but also the bombings that took place in Narita, Japan. I'll also in a moment just come uh, to my colleague Megha, but let me on that note also bring in our guests who have joined us on the broadcast. I have with me Group Captain MJ Augustine Vinod and uh, Lieutenant General Kamaljeet Singh. Let me begin with Lieutenant General Kamaljeet Singh. Kamaljeet Singh, sir, you've heard some of the details of how the aircraft, the, the progression uh, of the aircraft. What is the first thought that strikes your mind, sir, when you hear the details of India's investigation, which I'd like to point out again was completed within a few months of the uh, bombing, something that Canada took over three decades to put out to the world? Uh, Mega, firstly, uh, Jahin, it's... Uh on a very somber note, I join your this program. Uh, having gone through this report, uh, firstly, first feeling comes is of appreciation to Justice B. N. Kirpal, who's put out such, such a detailed kind of a report, giving full sequence of what all seem to have transpired. And he has also given prescriptive uh, recommendations, which ICAO, uh, International Civil Aviation Organization and others should have taken into account. 
अनफॉर्चुनेटली दिस इज वॉट लीड्स टू मल्टीपल एक्सीडेंट्स एंड इफ यू इफ ओनली दिस रिपोर्ट वॉज टेकन सो सीरियसली नाइन इलेवन कुड हैव ऑल्सो बीन प्रिवेंटेड इन सम फेज सो एविएशन सिक्योरिटी हैज रियली लुकड अप आफ्टर नाइन इलेवन अगेन इट्स माई टेररिज्म वर्सेज योर टेररिज्म योर लाइफ आर चीपर आर लाइफ आर हैव टू बी अकाउंटेड फॉर बट या वॉट इज सरप्राइजिंग इज दैट बिसाइड्स नॉट फॉलोइंग द रिकमेंडेशन द इन्वेस्टिगेशन वॉज ऑल्सो पॉस्ट अप इट वॉज नॉट फॉलोड थ्रू कंप्लीटली एंड इनफ एलिबाइज फॉर allowed to be created and people got away scot free and see see the level of confusion one just one thing makes a reservation changes his ticket from just one thing to m singh and one mohinder pal singh makes a reservation and changes his ticket to l singh and they they do not board they convince the agent that even when i am in the queue and waiting in a waiting mode i have not yet got confirmed seat you get my baggage checked in you get put my baggage as a transit baggage and you put it on to the flight these are very serious and grave errors they don't they shouldn't happen in the first world country like canada uh, you could accept it happening in some very underdeveloped country where you don't have basic sense of civil aviation security here uh, it's happening in canada it's being allowed to us no so it's it's very distressing mega when i read this report it's fascinating also it's in such details he is given uh, graphical diagrams giving the sequence so all in all compliments to justice kripal for putting right. out such a detailed report Sir, I'll come back to you, Group Captain MJ. Before we move on to Megha with the next part, I'd just like to bring in your thoughts as well, sir. Uh, we've been doing a detailed, of course, uh, understanding of the reports that have been put out, and we've also learned that on the first of June, Air India actually issued a warning to all of its global headquarters, and that warning reached uh, Canada as well. Despite that, why do you think that this person, M Singh, and a few others were actually just allowed to check in their baggage without ever boarding the flight? a uh, great question mega i am may i uh, request your intelligence to take us to page number 173 of this uh, 200 odd page report if you go to page number 173 I mean as i am talking i'm sure your back end will pull it up if you go to page number 173 um point number 5 decimal 5 and point number uh 5 decimal 8 these are two important paragraphs which was not being done pre kanishka post kanishka like i said yesterday article 17 was revisited and this was made mandatory what does point number 5 decimal 5 tell us the baggage of interlined passengers should be matched with the passengers by the onboard carriers before loading the baggage on the aircraft which is exactly what general talked about you can't have a l sing booking the bag and an m sing traveling on that baggage tag you have to match the baggage with the passengers so if i mean i'm sure you uh, traveled a lot and you traveled in an aeroplane which lands at one place and uh, you're sitting in the aircraft while the aeroplane is going to another place where the security personnel come and match your baggage with you most of us have seen that in uh, day to day airline operations when we are traveling that has started happening post kanishka come to passenger uh, page number 5 decimal 8 very important for our viewers to understand and especially viewers who don't tra- travel often in airline there are two things called no show passengers and gate no show passengers passengers let me explain that a little no show are the ones who don't come to your counter at all who don't uh, either i mean we do e check in these days or web check in these days those days you had to take a physical boarding pass people who don't come and take a physical boarding pass are called no show no show passengers but the gate no show passengers passengers are those who have taken the boarding pass entered the uh, uh, airport uh, and they are post security check so between security check 
and the gate of the aeroplane is called a sterile area. So they are in the sterile area, shopping around, having a drink or two, and it has happened many times that people have, you know, in the sterile area taken a little too many drinks and have either, you know, not shown up at the gate at all. So those are called gate no so passengers. Should so before Kanishka, that was before five decimal eight. Let's read five decimal eight clearly. Passengers count should be done at the boarding gate and in case of no gate no show passenger, it has got no gate show likhaya, but actually today it is called gate no sh uh, show passengers. His baggage or his or her baggage must be offloaded. Earlier it was not being offloaded. Suppose you took the boarding pass, came into the sterile area and you suppose have, have, having a cup of tea and you missed the flight. Your baggage would go to your destination, you will be without the baggage. Today, it does not happen. You, if you don't board the aeroplane, the baggage handlers again have to climb up the entire baggage mountain and take out your baggage. That started happening because of 5 decimal 8 and it didn't happen immediately. It took uh, ICAO another one year plus to implement this particular uh, you know, rule as part of the international rule. So it became an international rule post Kanishka. Five decimal nine is also something very, very important. The earlier X-ray machines were not mandatory. Today, after Kanishka, X-ray machines to scan the baggage became mandatory. And post that, a lot of other things came in like the sniffer dogs. And there are uh, special high-end uh, machines which uh, look for explosives specifically. And then there's something called MEX convention came up. Mex convention talks about plastic explosives because plastic explosives during Kanishka was yes. uh, X-ray machine transparent. So in Mex convention, they said, okay, plastic explosives also needs to be marked as such. That means any plastic, suppose I'm a plastic yes, explosive sir. manufacturer, I will have to put some dye uh, identifying my explosive. So right. when you, during, uh, during the explosion, you can come up with plastic explosives, you know who's the manufacturer. Over to you, Nika. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much uh, for bringing us to some of those recommendations as well. Brian, I'll come to you in just a moment. Please stay on. Uh, you, of course, managed to access this report for NewsX. So we'll come to you in just a moment. But uh, going back to Megha so that we can just go over more details, Megha, uh, with our viewers. All right. Now, after uh, the explanation that has been done for the first part of the report, here I have... Uh, the part of the report that goes about giving detailed information about the personnel that were on board. Now, here it is the pilot in command, Captain H.S. Narendra. Uh, he had an experience of uh, several years. He, he was aged 56 and a half years, date of birth 25th November 1928. He joined Air India on 1st of October 1956. Now, amidst all the other information that has been provided about H.S. Narendra is about his total flying experience, which was 20,379.15 hours, his pilot in command experience of 6,364.50 hours, and so on and so forth. I'm going to again bring forth uh, the other co-pilot that was flying the aircraft and here it is Captain S.S. Binder. Captain S.S. Binder again 41 and a half years of age, date of birth 30th November 1943, joined Air India on 12th of October 1977. There is also details of his flying experience uh, to ensure that there is a, a no discrepancy that is found when the report was filed. So every single person, every single part has been dissected and provided in the report. Now there is also information about the flight engineer, Mr. D.D. Dumasya. Now he's, he was aged 57 and, and a half years of age, date of birth 10th of October 1927. He joined Air India on 27th December 1954. And he held the flight engineer's uh, license of number 37, which was rallied up to 6th, 6th of December 19. 85. Now again, his information, his medical records, his medical ex examination that was done prior to him actually being on board of the flight. Then there is information about the cabin crew. Cabin crew, this is uh, Mr. S. L. Razar, uh, in-flight sub-supervisor. There's flight pursuer, flight pursuers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, assistant flight pursuers 5 in number again. 
and there are air hostesses from 11 to 19, which is nine of them, all details that have been provided about that. Then there's also information about the aircraft, which was manufactured by Messrs. Boeing Company under uh, 21473 serial number. The aircraft was acquired by Air India on the 19th of June, 1978. And... Uh, and, and, and this, this is all general information that has been provided to do a do deep in-depth analysis of what went wrong. There are also information about how this flight was uh, ready to go with no snags, with no pre incidents, but, but what has also been provided was in the past, were there any incidents or snags that had been witnessed by this flight in the previous takeoffs and the previous journeys it had taken forth. Now, uh, with regards to an incident that had taken place on 13th of July on 1984, there was a flight that had gone and landed in Dubai. There were other such incidents that have also been reported where the flight had gone to Delhi, to Rome, to London, to again Delhi, and then again in Dubai. I'm going to move on to the other important uh, information that was provided, particularly with regards to the aircraft, which was traveling to London from Toronto. Now, there was some difficulty that was experienced while loading one of the pallets having Intel cowl of the pod engine. To enable the loading of the cowl, the Air Canada Engineering and the maintenance personnel removed door stop fittings from the craft cargo compartment door cut out. After removal of the fittings, the pallet could then be loaded and all the removed fittings were then reinstalled and the removal and the installation of the fittings was certified by Mr. Rajendra. Now, uh, uh, okay, also this, this is all information with regards to all that was done to ensure the fitness of the aircraft. Uh, and then if we take a look at uh, Okay, this information. Now, as per the inspection report that was submitted, it showed that there was no corrosion that was noticed on the significant primary structural members of the aircraft. Surface corrosion was, corrosion was however, noticed on some of the member, members below the toilets in the galley. So, so again, you know, there has been an overall check that had been done and all information again has been corroborated in this report. There is also meteorological information which goes about providing what was the surface wind, the surface visibility, surface temperature, the, the cloud conditions, freezing levels and so on and so forth. Uh, with regard to the upper air situation, the report indicates that mainly west or west-northwest airflow covered the area of flight 310. The jet stream was centered at around 48 degrees north uh, and sunlight conditions were prevailing at the time of the accident. There were no segments valid for the air area at the time. And uh, here's to the communication that happened between the flight uh, and their pilot and the co-pilot and the ATC. There was a two-way communication between the ill-fated flight and the ATS units of Canada and Ireland, which was maintained during the flight from Montreal to the time of crash. The communications were recorded on the ATC tapes. Now, transcripts of these relevant tapes were provided by the Canadian a Aviation Safety Board and the Director of the Air Traffic Services in Ireland. Now, from this transcript of communication, it is observed that the two-way communication between the aircraft and the various ATS units was normal and the last contact with the aircraft was uh, at uh, 70, uh, 709 hours, 58, sec 58 seconds, mi minutes and then it's, it also informed that the Shannon UAC that it was squawking and the tape transcript also showed that the aircraft did not transmit any information regarding the emergency and on which it was last working with Shannon UAC or on distress frequency of 121.5 megahertz. And after that, if we take a look at the next few pages, and it goes on to show when was there a contact, where were the rescue operations initiated. And this is the search and rescue operation that was initiated. This is the time at 7 hours 30 minutes. 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m. is when Shannon UAC informed the Marine Rescue Coordination Center that uh, the, the aircraft Boeing 747 en route Montreal, London had disappeared from the secondary surveillance radar at 7.13 in position. And this is the position that they've mentioned, 51 North, 120 West. Shannon requested to take emergency section at 7.40 
AM, MRCC Shannon telephonically explained the situation to Valencia Coast radio station. It requested a pan broadcast urgently to ask the vessels and areas to keep sharp lookout and report to Valencia radio. At 7.46, Valencia radio has transmitted to all the stations pan message and above advice to the ships as well. Now at 7.50, the Irish, the Irish naval vessel uh, Aislinn G reported to the Valencia radio that it was 54 miles away from the site of the accident. It was proceeding now to the site. Valencia radio passed on this information to Telex to the MRCC Sash, Sash, uh, Shannon. Now between 7.40 and 7.50 a.m. the MRCC then briefed the Irish Naval Service and uh, the Irish Army Air Corps were Informed about the situation at 7.54 a.m., the MRCC relayed a distress message to Shannon Air Dio via, via the uh, aeronautical fixed telecommunication network. At, at 8.03 is when Valencia Radio again transmitted the span message and the advice to the ships. By 8.40, the cannon vessel Laurasian Forest BHB, HBWP which was registered in Panama and owned by Federal Commerce of Montreal, reported that it was 22 miles away from the distress area. It was proceeding there. Now, the Laurentian inquired that there were other ships in the area and was informed about the position. At 8.13, Valencia Radio also informed the MRCC Shannon by Telex about Laurentian Forest. Now, between 8.15 and 8.20, there is more Communication that has happened, MRCC Shannon has updated RCC Plymouth and then advised that a Nimod rescue aircraft would then depart shortly for area and seeking helicopters were already en route the Cork airport initially. Edinburgh RCC advised MRCC Shannon that a Nimrod rescue aircraft was being prepared at Kinloss. Now at 8.20 again, so while there are ships that are being sent out to the distress area, to the accident where it has happened in the Atlantic, there are also helicopters and there are planes that are also being directed towards that area. Now Shannon Radio also informed Valencia Radio that there was message from Shanic Oceanic control that aircraft was picking up ELT signal in, in the position and the actual position was believed to be 51 West 1250 West. At 8.33 Valencia Radio has again sent out a message giving the in information and requesting ships in the area to report to Valencia Radio. 8.42 what we find out is that there is another uh, transmission that has happened between Alibaba and Valencia. Valencia Radio that it was at the position and was listening on 121.5 megahertz. By 8.50 a.m. the Western Arctic had informed Valencia Radio its position and it would proceed to about 20 minutes from bringing a cable. So, so these fast paced communications have happened between a number of these radio and, uh, 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 and the communications on, on various megahertz, 121, 119, to ensure that there could be signal that could be caught between the aircraft that had already fallen into the sea. So that's, so, so Rishabh, that's, that these are the communications that have been provided in this entire detailed report. And finally, if we take a look at, uh, at the end, here, here it shows that there was a continuous search that was maintained throughout the day on the 24th of June, but only, but only one further body and numerous pieces of wreckage had been recovered. An extensive search was also maintained throughout the day and instructions were passed by Shannon to Valencia requesting all shipping to recover any wreckage or bodies found. So, so on the 24th, there were a minimal of two bodies that had been found, Rishabh. Yeah, and, okay. uh, and, and, and that's and in fact there is more interesting information yeah, if you we, point we out about which are these zones in the aircraft which got the maximum injury the minimum injury and how was it all uh, then described further absolutely and we'll come to that in just a moment to where there's a section on injuries to persons but I have a lot of guests with us and I request them all to stay on with us because these are 220 pages that we want to go through in detail for our viewers for more such videos subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel hit the bell icon